Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, to talk about, not to be announced, but about minimal seats uh, for, for dynamos. Um, and I will define the title, but uh, first I would like to say that most I'm going to show is done with uh, Paul Menix, who is a postdoc working with me in Nice, and uh, Yannick Ponty, who is a colleague from uh, Observatoire de la Côte d'Azur, whom you know. And also, if time allows, I will briefly mention some, uh, some work in collaboration with various people. Um, some of them, I mean, Steve is in the room. Okay, so um, I, will, I will start by defining what minimal dynamo seeds are. Um, so in everything I'm going to say, the, the uh, flows we are interested in are flows where we suspect or we know that there is a subcritical dynamo at work somewhere, but we don't necessarily know what it's supposed to look like, and we don't have an easy access to it, um, meaning that um, the flow we are looking at is either a linearly stable to dynamo instability at all RMs, for example, so the, we can't use um, uh, tiny perturbations to, to drive us to the to dynamo and then uh, follow the, the dynamo branch uh, backwards in parameter space, or the flow can be linearly unstable to dynamo instability, but the, the regions where uh, the flow becomes linearly unstable um, is, I mean, this region of the parameter um, space is so expensive numerically or experimentally that in practice we cannot afford to explore it. So we have two, motivation, two motivations in mind here. We want to be able to identify systematically uh, a subcritical branch numerically without having to rely on continuation. And we also want to be able uh, to, I mean, for a given region of the parameter space, we want to be able to uh, identify what is the smallest energy perturbation, um, so which is called the minimal dynamo seed, uh, which you need to prescribe to um, initiate the transition to uh, the dynamo. So, and, and by identifying this, uh, this seed, it means we have to identify both its amplitude and its spatial structure. And the motivation uh, for astrophysical purposes here is that we want to be able to assess the likeliness of such a perturbation occurring in a real true flow. And importantly, I want to stress that already now, what we want is to be able to identify this completely blindly. So we don't want to have to make assumptions about the spatial structure of the solution once we get there. We don't want to make assumptions about the symmetries. We don't want to know about the underlying physics. I mean, we want it to be an output, not an input of the method. Okay, and so I'm going to show how this can be done. So, and Steve announced that I would uh, be stating a few motivations, so I'm not going to be exhaustive. These are just a little, um, a little important uh, examples of flows for which we are very interested in, in, in using that method. Um, so the first motivation is to understand the magnetism of uh, accretion disks, um, because these magnetic fields have been uh, detected in the innermost part, innermost part of accretion disks, showing that they really have their own magnetic fields. Not, it's not only the, the magnetic field of the central object. And a distinct but related question is to understand accretion because these accretion disks are essentially Keplerian and Keplerian velocities are uh, velocity profiles or are um, uh, assumed uh, allegedly stable, except in cosmological codes apparently. Uh, but when we, when we estimate the transport of angular momentum um, from uh, accretion luminosities, um, and if you want to model that transport of angular momentum using an effective viscosity, the, the effective viscosity you have to plug in um, is actually many orders of uh, la, uh, magnitude larger than uh, the, the, vis the molecular viscosity. So which means that these objects must be turbulent. And so it is natural to look for subcritical dynamo mechanisms to explain in one shot um, the disk magnetism and the possible subcritical transition from HD turbulence. So that's one of the motivation. Um, other motivations is to understand the magnetism of um, uh, radiative stellar layers, which are stably stratified. So in these layers, uh, we don't have an obvious source of hydrogen turbulence that could power a dynamo. Um, and uh, several observations actually point to uh, the important role of subcriticality in, uh, in these uh, objects. One of these observations is the so-called magnetic desert, which is an observational gap that is uh, observed in uh, intermediate mass stars, massive stars, where the radiative layer is outside, it's uh, located in the, in the envelope, so it's easier to probe with spectral parameters. And for these stars, what is seen is that they display either very strong steady dipolar fields, 
uh, which are fixed in, in time and, and or they, they have very weak or uh, magnetic fields or no, no, no field at all, or at least no detectable one. And these fields are complicated in uh, the spatial structure and they, they are uh, shifting in time. So they are assumed to be of dynamo origin. So this kind of picture already insights of criticality. And another um, reason why we are interested in understanding uh, the magnetism of these layers is to understand the transport of angular momentum again. So Lorraine already showed that picture uh, from the uh, Celia paper uh, showing that, so it's already, it's already known that um, including the magnetic fields in the stellar evolution model is crucial to understand the, the smoothing of um, uh, rotation profiles. And there is a strong interest at the moment uh, at uh, numerically identifying um, a, a, a subcritical dynamo model, which is called the Taylor sproit dynamo. I mean, it's subcritical in essence; it doesn't have to be. Um, and this this uh, dynamo mechanism was uh, predicted by Sproit uh, 20 years ago, and it's uh, assumed to be very efficient at transporting angular momentum. And Florentin is going to present some um, uh, numerical simulations of uh, a, a mechanism that really looks like Taylor sproit dynamo on Friday. Okay, and the last motivation is of course Earth um, and uh, the, the long lasting challenge of uh, um, identifying numerically the strong branch of the geodynamo where we would have this balance between uh, Coriolis force and uh, Lorentz force that is assumed to be relevant to Earth's core. And what would be really nice would be to uh, identify um, these strong branch solutions even below the, the, onset of, uh, the linear onset of uh, convection because then we could possibly explain how to drive a thermal, um, thermally convective dynamo um, despite a tight energy budget. Okay, so having said all that, I'm not going to be in the astrophysically relevant parameter regime, but these are the motivations. Okay, and now I will ask you to forget about dynamo for a while and we will talk about uh, zero B flows. Um, and I would like to tell you about a, a very old problem and that's turbulence in a pipe. So really pipe flow, circular pipe uh, flow without any magnetic field. And this pipe flow is known uh, to be linearly stable at all Reynolds number. Um, but it's also very well known um, that uh, the transition to turbulence can be observed down to quite moderate uh, Reynolds numbers. And this has been demonstrated first um, uh, by Lord Reynolds himself uh, with the famous Manchester experiment. And this experiment was uh, performed again uh, and again and again in various environments, in quiet environments. Um, and the transition to turbulence could be delayed up to much larger Reynolds numbers. And um, experimentally, it was soon apparent that the typical size of the perturbations that was required to trigger um, the transition to turbulence was some decaying power law of the Reynolds number. But experimentally, it's very difficult to control the spatial structure of the perturbations you are prescribing. Um, so it's very difficult to really assess the, uh, I mean, with accuracy, um, the, the, the size of the, the basin of attraction of the, of the uh, turbulence. Um, and, and theoretically, it's also very hard to take into account finite amplitude perturbations. So there is a theoretical result by Joseph and Carmi um, stating that for, uh, Reynolds number smaller than 81.49, exactly, um, all perturbations should decay monotonically in energy, um, which is extremely restrictive. So that's why this is a very uh, constraining stability bound. And it's too, too restrictive because, of course, it doesn't account for transient growth, with, um, which is possible even in a linearly stable flow uh, due to the non normality of the Navier Stokes operator. So it was an important breakthrough to start um, performing non-modal stability analysis, uh, meaning looking for the most amplified perturbations um, in, a, in, a, in a given flow. With, I mean, first it was done in a, a linearized framework with the hope that possibly the most amplified uh, superposition of um, decaying eigenmodes would be, it would be so amplified that it would trigger non-linearities and possibly in the real system sustain turbulence. And then with um, uh, increasing computational power, it was possible to, to keep all the nonlinearities in the flow dynamics and, and therefore to identify for the first time minimal seeds for the tr transition to, uh, to turbulence. So at a given Reynolds number, it was possible to identify both the amplitude and the spatial structure of the least energy perturbation uh, initiating the transition to turbulence. 
And this was being done in various fixed shear flows, so not only in Poise, but also in quet flow, um, some boundary layers, et cetera. So I just put a few references, but there are many, many papers out there on that. And so there is no reason why this wouldn't work for MHD and dynamo, uh, subcritical dynamos. We have this additional um, question that we don't necessarily know what the subcritical branch looks like and whether it exists at all. Okay, so I'm going to show how it works uh, while explaining the method directly uh, um, uh, applied to the dynamo, the dynamo problem. Okay, so the core or the method is to ask an optimization question inside of a stability one. So in the dynamo case, what we can do is to look for an initial condition of the magnetic field B0, which has a given energy budget M0 fixed. And we are trying to maximize um, some, uh, some quantity of interest and it's natural here uh, to maximize, for example, the accumulated um, uh, magnetic energy, the total magnetic energy um, over space and time then. And what we really need to do is to compute the gradient of this uh, cost function with respect to uh, B0, the initial condition. But that can be extremely expensive if B0 has a large dimension, meaning if our DNS is well resolved. So a cheap way of, I mean, relative, relatively cheap way of estimating this gradient is to look uh, for adjunct-based optimal control. And instead of directly minimizing uh, J, we are looking for stationary points of um, uh, this Lagrangian here, but it's strictly equivalent. So this Lagrangian is actually the cost function we are trying to maximize here, augmented by uh, some constraints we have to prescribe by means of Lagrange multipliers, so all the tildes are Lagrange multipliers. And the constraints we want to prescribe are here, of course, that we want the flow to satisfy the Navier-Stokes equations, induction equations, and we want P and U to be divergence free. Everything is expressed in Lagrange units, by the way. Okay, so to do that, so we look for a stationary point. So we have to take the variations of the Lagrangian with respect to all the variables. So the direct variables, the physical ones, and also the Lagrange multipliers. And when we do that, we will recover uh, a bunch of equations. Among them, we will recover our constraints. That was um, all what it was about. So the, the MHD, fully nonlinear MHD equations. We will also recover equations for the Lagrange multipliers, which we call the adjunct uh, fields. And these equations um, are called the adjoint variables. You, you can see that they are best expressed in reverse time, otherwise this would blow up. Um, and we also end up having um, compat so-called compatibility conditions that relate uh, the terminal fields uh, B and U, so the physical variables to the terminal values of the Lagrange multipliers. And so it, and it works as, as follows. So what we do is we start with some B0, with energy M0, um, usually some noise, and we perform a DNS from t equal to zero to, to target time big T. So that's just normal DNS. Then we convert using the, the conditions we found before by canceling all the variations of the functional. Um, we convert these terminal conditions of the physical variables into terminal conditions for the Lagrange multipliers. And then we use that to start a reverse time uh, integration um, of the adjunct equations up to time t equal to zero. And now that's the, the, all the point of, of that was to actually estimate B tilde zero, which is so the initial condition for the Lagrange multiplier, which is exactly giving us um, the gradient of the functional L uh, with respect to B zero, which we, we wanted. So it's relatively cheap uh, as an estimate, a way of estimating that. And once we have that, I mean, if we were super, super, super lucky and, and looked for B0, which was already optimal in the first place, then this should be zero and we have nothing to do, but this is never going to happen. So we have uh, gradient information to update B0 using a descent algorithm. And I mean, descent algorithm not, and also a descent algorithm. And we, we update B0 until uh, the, the procedure converges, um, meaning that this residual becomes small. Okay, so this is the adjunct-based optimal control um, principle. Uh, in, the, in the dynamo program, it has been done in the case of kinematic dynamo uh, for the induction equation by Ashley Willis and then extended to uh, various geometries by uh, Witzer Herman, Andrew Jackson and collaborators. Okay, so this is about optimization. Now, if we want to do stability analysis, we have to do a little bit more. So what we do first is we pick up a target time T 
uh, long enough and I can explain that later. Uh, we pick up an initial energy budget in zero. And then we perform what I just say. So this adjoint-based optimal control here to find what's the best B0. So what is the B0 that optimizes the magnetic energy, blah, blah, blah. And we do that. We look for B0 among the solutions that are energy M0, of course. And then once we have this uh, B0 optimum, we use it as an initial condition for a new DNS, uh, usually even more resolved. And this one we let run for very, 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 very long times. We need to be sure that what we are looking at is not a transient, but it's really a sustained dynamo. And then we look at the DNS and did we really get a sustained dynamo state or not? And depending on the, on the answer, we either decrease or increase M0 and then we start over. Okay, so we are actually coupling the optimization with the continuation in the energy budget. Okay, and we, want, uh, we wanted to do that in various geometries using various DNS codes and also, we wanted to be flexible in changing the algorithm, uh, uh, optimization algorithm. So with Yannick, we are progressively building a big flexible interface where you can plug in your favorite DNS code. And we'll be probably talking about that in uh, the second workshop uh, in Leeds. Um, OK, so we wanted to test the method. So the first thing we did was looking at uh, a flow where we knew we would not be looking for something that doesn't exist. Uh, and this flow is the Taylor Green flow. So first by this uh, 2D three coordinates flow uh, in a triply periodic box. And this force is, this force uh, drives a, an array of uh, counter rotating vertices, which are quite turbulent in the regime we are looking at. Because in this regime, um, Yannick and collaborators already shown that um, the flow was hosting a subcritical dynamo. So what they did is that they increased the magnetic frontal number up to the point where the flow was becoming linearly unstable to dynamo, then they went up there and they restarted the DNS while decreasing the magnetic frontal number. And so they were able to describe the subcritical branch this way by continuation. And so we already know what the dynamo looks like in this, in this branch. It is, uh, uh, so these are actually magnetic tubes arranged in two parallel planes in, in the, in the in the triplet periodic box. So this, all this is already now. So what we do is we pick up a magnetic quantum number, which is well below uh, the linear onset of uh, dynamo instability. And we look uh, for the minimal seeds using the uh, QB code uh, Yannick developed some years ago for the DNS and also for the agents. We have to modify that code. And the minimal seed we find, so the least energy perturbation that was found to spontaneously evolve towards uh, the saturated state that was already known, looks like that. So it's a little bit surprising because it does nothing to do with the end state. And it's something really simple, it's just a magnetic ring. Um, so what you see in red are magnetic lines and blue are current lines. So it's really a small magnetic ring that is very conveniently located um, I mean, we did that several times, uh, starting from different velocity snapshots, and we always found the same structure, but it was in various places, but it was always in a flow stagnation point. And this is um, something that can be understood because the, the, uh, this way, the, the, the seed is really exploiting the, the strong line stretch, stretching, and this translates into a very strong early amplification of the magnetic energy. So you can see that the magnetic energy uh, increases by almost four orders of magnitude. Um, starting from this minimal seed. And so the, 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 one, the, the feature I want, to, I want to emphasize is that these minimal seeds are localized in, so that all the energy budget is expanded in the most efficient way. And also they lie in the stagnation point, so where, where amplification will be maximal. And that is very reminiscent of what people who are doing this minimal seed identification uh, turbulence are seeing. Um, okay, so we did that for several, so I just, needed to say that it, this, is, this was the uh, optimization window. So it, it is actually here. And when we perform the DNS, we could check that it was really a sustained dynamo state. Okay, we could do that for several PMs. And, and, and by doing that, we can actually describe what's the, the width of the basin of the attraction for the dynamo solution. Okay, am I late? Okay, I should probably hurry. Um, the second test case we have been looking at is a uh, Keplerian uh, quit flow. So the idea is that um, if you are looking at a small numerical domain that is far from a spinning axis, in the sense that the thickness of the domain is small compared to the cylindrical radius, uh, then you can use a plane quit flow to um, 
uh, model to provide a, a local model of uh, uh, this Kepler-Yang flow, provided you choose carefully the ratio between the over rotation rate and the, and the shear velocity. So we, the, we know that this flow is not capable of uh, linear dynamation. So any dynamo solution has to be subcritical. And uh, I'm saying that already because I will need it in the next slide. Uh, we are prescribing perfectly bo uh, conducting boundaries on, uh, in, in that direction. Okay, so we have been looking at this frame in particular in a particular regime because of a beautiful paper by Francois Rincon who and collaborators who constructed um, exact um, uh, subcritical magnetic, scale, uh, magnetic states for Reynolds number around 10. Um, I mean, as Jonathan explained uh, uh, yesterday, it has to be when you want to do that kind of thing, you have to look at very small Reynolds number because you are looking for solutions that are steady. Um, what he did was something a little bit inspired of uh, something that was done by uh, Balefa in, uh, in shear flows is actually prescribing an artificial electromagnetic force that is introducing a linear instability, your MRI, to the flow and then progressively getting rid of this artic artificial EMF using a um, Newton iteration. So this is very costly and yet to use various symmetries to, to, to preserve the cost. And we found that these symmetries were critical to the state stability, but nevertheless, it was a very good um, uh, hint that there should be something to find in that region of the parameter space. So we could not find something stable for Reynolds as low as 10, but for Reynolds 25, for example, it was possible to identify um, dynamo seeds. Um, so this was done using the Diddler's code. Uh, Daniel will be probably writing about uh, on Thursday or Friday. Um, and this was used for the DNS and, uh, and the adjunct, adjunct part of the, of the optimal control loop. We don't enforce any symmetries. And this is what the seed looks like. Um, it's essentially transverse in the sense that all the energy is in the by bz component, x being the streamwise component. And we understand why this is the, uh, a good thing because um, the omega effects uh, rapidly winds up this, um, this component to, to create a large scale um, magnetic field that is essentially streamwise. And this becomes unstable to MRI uh, once. Um, so, okay, omega effects explains the very early amplification here. And then once this large scale BX becomes sufficiently strong, it becomes also unstable to MRI. So you'll see the instability kicking in here. And once this is done, the 3D fluctuations can replenish uh, through nonlinearity the large scale field. So we understand the dynamo loop without having to inject anything about the our possible physical knowledge of the underlying um, dynamo process. Okay, so uh, I'm almost on time. Uh, so this is where we stand. The, we, we, we show that this method can indeed identify some critical dynamos and their minimal seeds even if the, the flow is time evolving or, or, or even uh, turbulent, what is really crucial for the accuracy of the nonlinear analysis, uh, stability analysis, is the quality of the gradient estimate, because if it's too bad, I mean, the procedure is never going to converge. So Paul has been working a lot on uh, optimizing the optimization uh, algorithm and also optimizing the, the way the adjunct uh, code is, uh, is um, um, obtained. Um, okay, so this is coming soon, I hope. Um, and because it, it's really shown to improve a lot the convergence of the, of the algorithm and is now looking at the global solutions now in the cylindrical uh, quasi Kepler case. Now, I will just mention briefly that with uh, William Bethune, Eloise Meu, and Yannick, we're also looking now at the nonlinear stability of non magnetized Kepler flows, and that's supposed to be an open question. In the, um, Okay, in the field. And then there is also this recent work I wanted to mention uh, with Scale and Skin and, and Steve uh, in Leeds. Uh, we are now applying this, uh, this method to identify uh, the strong branch of the geodynamo. So that's the, um, that's the goal. And as a very preliminary um, step toward this, uh, um, this ideal goal, we are, we've been looking at the uh, minimal seeds for geodynamo solutions um, in a flow that was already well known, and that's the case one in the Dynamo benchmark, where the um, way we initialize uh, the, the simulation, of course, is important, and we are actually trying to assess what's the size of the basin of attraction. And so you can, uh, Kalem is going to show much, much more results uh, in needs, uh, where he will see, he will show you how the optimizing the structure modifies um, a lot of the energy you need to, to inject. Okay, and I will stop here and thank you for, ah, no, okay. Last slide because otherwise Yannick will be angry. Um, you are all to come to Nice uh, next year. 
in September, uh, we are hosting a conference on the GFD. And I needed to mention, I mean, Yannick was very insistent on that. So this is currently the uh, temperature of uh, the well-mixed layer above the, the thermocline in Nice. So it's uh, almost 10, 10 degrees higher than what we have here in the room, just saying. And, and this is uh, Hotel Saint-Paul where the conference will, will be hosted. So come to Nice. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Is this on? No. Oh. Hello. No, it doesn't work anymore. One. Two. <laughs> uh, another mic is well, coming to you. Oh, a new one. Thank you. This is on. Okay, so uh, questions to Florence. In, I, I think one of the first cases you showed was the Taylor Green flow. Uh, I just wanted to see if I really understood what, what you're doing there. So you're solving not only the adjoint induction equation, but the adjoint momentum equation. Yeah, well. absolutely. I wonder if, if you just did the simpler calculation of thinking of it, the kinematic phase, and mm -hmm. you just solved the adjoint induction equation and yeah. found what's the sort of minimal seed in that sense so what initial condition would grow kinematically as fast as possible so you mean not the minimal seed but the most amplified perturbation yeah so basically what's the fastest growing eigenmode of the adjoint induction equation um, look anything like the minimal seeds you've ended up with? i suspect that we would end up having the same thing as what we do when we do the same thing i mean including the momentum equation but in the in this uh, area where it's completely pointless to do that, but you just have the faster growing mode coming up. You are you end up with something that really looks like that, very rapidly emerging, like the end states. So I don't know if that would possibly pop in. We have not we have not do, been doing it, uh, working on the, only the induction equation. Is it that I would naively imagine that if you want something which is going to grow as fast as possible, it's going to start out being kinematic. So why don't you optimize just for the kinematic problem? Or doing the harder task of optimizing for the, for the non-linear problem. Yeah, it still wouldn't tell you what's the minimal seed because you, I mean, you still need to, you see, you still need to do something about the flow so that it can sustain uh, after a while. So I'm not. Wait, we we could compare, but. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other? Question or comment? Or, okay. The six, I'm not sure it would be localized. Um, have Have you tried uh, using the adjoint looping for the uh, when you had the range of zone when you're stably stratified for the when we have what? Sorry. Uh, have you tried doing the adjoint looping for the uh, Taylor Sprue Dynamo? No, no, no. But that's something I want to do. Yeah. Definitely. It's a little bit more expensive, so we, we were uh, going at easy problems first. Yeah. Especially because then I could get rid of the question I have uh, sometimes about, yes, you are talking about data support numerical models, but how likely is it uh, in, a, in a real flow? Is there any other? Question, comment. I think David has a question actually, but he's too shy to ask it. <laughs> <laughs> Who's too shy? Okay. No. <laughs> no. no, Professor David Jukes is too shy. <laughs> it's actually a joke on me. He keeps asking me uh, if I know how to explain <laughs> the subcriticality of the Taylor Green Dynamo. And the, the, the game is that I'm supposed to say, I don't know. But yet, I think I know. I mean, I have a piece, which is that. OK, I'm, I'm asking the question and answering myself. <laughs> um, because it has been shown that the Taylor Green Dynamo was, uh, I mean, the, the, the onset, the threshold for the Taylor Green Dynamo was uh, really sen uh, sensitive to the, uh, the fluctuations, the velocity fluctuations. And, 
uh, it has also been shown by confining the flow with prescribed symmetries that um, when you suppress these velocity fluctuations or when you, I mean, decrease the amplitude, then the threshold could be lower. And I would like to be able to say that with this uh, uh, magnetic field that we are introducing, the size of the fluctuations is uh, significantly smaller once we reach that state, and that poss could possibly uh, release the constraint on the on the on the dynamo. But uh, I mean, if you look at this. Uh, figure it's impossible to say. But if you look with the eyes of faith, as I did this morning, um, at the at the kinetic energy curve, when you are in around that state, which doesn't show because I didn't put the blow up, I didn't want to talk too much about that state today. Uh, but when you look at the velocity fluctuations here, they are significantly damped uh, compared to uh, the early phase of uh, the dynamo. So possibly there could be an explanation there. It, it shows on the on the blow up. I can show you the the graph, but I'm not quite sure. It's a piece. I'm not quite sure that's the the explanation. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's very efficient. Okay, if there are no further questions, let's thank Florence again. Thank you. Actually, we have a prolonged coffee break, but, but uh, maybe one comment on your last slide. Uh, um, I like Nice very much, but sea surface temperatures above 26 degrees means there is a danger in this case for Medicaid, which is a newly invented word for uh, very nasty events, which are more known from the Caribbean, where the season temperature often is above 25 or 26 degrees. So yeah. we should be wary about climate change. <laughs> no, but it's true that uh, the uh, public uh, powers in Nice are getting worried about that. Okay, okay. They are expecting strong storms in the autumn and yeah. in the winter. Okay, now it's coffee break and quarter.